this story here with Professor Richard Wolf. Now, before I get into the video, I do want to go ahead and list the cities for you that were a part of the Rust Belt. I want to set the scene and then I want to get into the video. That's how we do, you know, just something we used to do in theater, set the scene <laughs> and then we get into it. So let's go ahead and bring up uh, this article here, Defining Rust Belt Urbanism. Now, this is from the Economic Innovation Group. Let me go ahead and drop down here because I think this is something I want people to see so you can understand. Like when we say the Rust Belt, what exactly are we talking about? So the Rust Belt has been given up for dead, at least economically, for the last 50 years. The broad swath of territory that covers northeastern and midwestern United States centered on the Great Lakes has seen decades of economic retrenchment, outmigration, unresolved racial tensions, and growing sense of irrelevance, especially when compared to America's globally connected coastal cities and fast-growing sunbelt cities. There are some who believe the Rust Belt should simply accept its diminished fate and fade into oblivion. Now, this article here is not linked to the video I'm gonna show you of Professor Wolf, but I found this article and I feel like it does relate to what he's going to discuss in that video. Now, what do we mean when we talk about the Rust Belt? Listen to this. In his introduction to EIG as the new Legacy Cities Fellow, Akron, Ohio planner Jason Segedy eloquently described the Rust Belt's former and current position in hierarchy of American cities. And this is the part I want to highlight here. Some of you, if you're watching and you're in the chat and you live in these cities or you're from these, cit these cities, you know, give a thumbs up or a shout out in the chat. Many city many cities, <laughs> many cities like Buffalo, Cleveland, Dayton, Detroit, Erie, Flint, Rochester, South Bend, Toledo, and Youngstown have experienced incredible ups and downs over the last 150 years. So look at this, Flint, Michigan. That's right. Because once upon a time, Flint, Michigan was not the Flint, Michigan that you know today as the city that has dirty water. Things have definitely changed. So I definitely wanted to highlight that one. I see someone saying Buffalo out in the, in the chat. I see we got Buffalo. I see we have Buffalo and native to Flint. Interesting, interesting. Now, I want to make the connection here with this video here with Professor Richard Wolf. Now, this is an interview that was done by RJ Eskow. Now, RJ, again, I've played some of his uh, interviews on here before. He has a channel called The Zero Hour with RJ Eskow. And he was actually a part of Bernie Sanders' campaign. I think it was the 2016 campaign that he was a part of. So he knows a lot about politics and he has all different types of conversations on his channel. So I think he's actually a really good interviewer. But what he's going to talk to Professor Wolf here in this segment is particularly about the Rust Belt and whether or not can it be saved. Again, if you live in those areas, I think this is incredibly important conversation because he's going to explain to you why it may or may not be saved. I don't want to give it away, but here we go. In the way of a coherent plan to revigorate, reinvigorate or revitalize uh, industrial America. Is it just dead and gone for good? What are your thoughts on that? Well, let me begin by saying that you and I have more in common than I had understood. I was born in a place called Youngstown, Ohio. Ah. And I could say literally word for word about that place, what you just told us about Utica. Uh, and it would be pretty accurate. Uh, Youngstown was once part of a what was called the steel belt in those days. It was a place that produced 
uh, various kinds of steel that go into other kinds of products and so on. Um, my father worked in a place called the Youngstown Sheet and Tube uh, Company, and those are two forms in which steel is produced and sold. Uh, so I'm, I'm acutely aware. Let me answer your question this way, and, and I'm going to be blunt because it has to be it has to be that way for it to be comprehensible. We allow as a society a tiny group of people, employers, together less than 1% of the population of this country, to make decisions about where to locate a production based on what is privately profitable for each of them to do. So if they go to Utica, it's because they foresee a profit by locating there. And when the time comes, if and when they see better profit prospects someplace else, they are free. That's part of what free enterprise means. They are free to close the business in Utica and move, for example, to Shanghai in China. Okay, let's chime in here for just a second because he talks about free market, free capitalism. And he pointed out something that I think we all should kind of take home with us. I don't know, write it on a post-it note and stick it up on our wall just as a reminder that we allow a small group of people to make these decisions. It's not the majority. It's not as if the workers get to vote on this, whether or not they want these locations to move. No, it's a small group of people, the people at the top, the people who own the company, typically the CEOs, they're the ones that decide whether or not they want to move it to another location. And the reason why they do that is because he said there's more profit doing it that way. Not because they just want to try something new, not because they're fond of the region per se, but because it's better for them when it comes to profit. It's not about you. It's not about the workers. It's not about what's best for the workers. It's about what's best for their bottom line and their pocket. And we have seen this happen over time with the Rust Belt City. So he just mentioned moving jobs over to places like China, moving jobs to Mexico. This is another thing that has come up. A lot of your automobile parts don't just come from Japan or from China. They also come from Mexico. So I mention this because this is why you see a city like Detroit that is no longer thriving the way that it did back during the Industrial Revolution. This is why. This is why Cleveland is not the way that it used to be during the Industrial Revolution. Did you know that Cleveland at one point had the most Fortune 500 companies in the United States? What happened? Greed happened. Cleveland wasn't always the Cleveland that you see today. And sometimes you have to talk to people who were around back then to hear it. People who have pictures of what it used to look like. Greed came in. That's what happened to those Rust Belt cities. But Professor Wolf is going to go into further detail here. So listen to this. I know or to Mexico City, or wherever they can be allowed to enter. The social costs of their decision to relocate are not their problem. In other words, if they fire 10,000 people who all of them, you know, can't make their mortgages or disrupt the lives of their children because they have to leave the schools that they've become comfortable in, you know, all of those kinds of things. That's no concern of the company that chooses to relocate. They don't have to compensate their workers for the, all these losses. They don't have to compensate the larger community, which of course loses out if you fire thousands of people from a place like Youngstown or Utica or Detroit or Camden, New Jersey, or the hundreds of other towns in this country that tell the same story. 
And something that I want to point out as well, when those companies do move, the people who can afford to move the workers that can afford to move with them can move with them. But the people who can't afford to move are stuck there. So they end up stuck in a Cleveland. They end up stuck in a Detroit. They end up stuck in a Baltimore. And while they are stuck there, more and more factories, more and more industrial steel companies are closing one by one. So now you're losing the jobs. And then when you lose the jobs, the education will start to decrease. And the education will decrease because you won't have people move into the city because there's no jobs. And if there's no jobs there, you don't have the teachers coming in wanting to teach there. And if you don't have the education system, and if you don't have the jobs, what do you end up having? A higher crime rate. And you get that higher crime rate because the poverty rate will increase. This is what happens when you take away the jobs. So when you hear people make these comments like, oh, it's all the black cities that have high crime. I want to remind you that there was a time when Detroit, which I think right now I'll double check it. I think Detroit's black population is like 80% of Detroit. There was a time when people, black people moved to those cities, black people, part of the great migration moved to a Detroit to get those jobs. They moved to places like a Gary, Indiana to get those jobs. They moved to Cleveland to get those jobs. So you had people coming there who wanted to work. And then they took the jobs away. Just keep that in mind. All of those people just lose. There is no responsibility for the company that makes the decision to leave to cope with the social disaster it leaves behind. That's the fundamental problem in this society. It is not a democratic decision. The vast majority of people affected by a corporate decision to move have no say over that decision. The, the corporate leadership, uh, the board of directors, the major shareholders, they have no responsibility, no accountability. This is an exercise in the social consequences of a fundamentally undemocratic economic system. There's no nice way to, to sugarcoat that, although I do bow my head to my colleagues in the economics profession because they have sure tried to sugarcoat their way around this dilemma. But <laughs> the reality of Utica and the reality of Youngstown and countless other cities uh, are a living witness uh, to the reality that I've just tried uh, to summarize. And I think, you know, we teach students in economics something called cost-benefit analysis, and it goes something like this. And everything is either a net benefit or a net cost. If you think about hiring someone, if you think about buying another truck for your business, if you think about extending a wing on a hospital, you're supposed to go through this exercise in which you list and measure all the quote-unquote positive consequences of such an investment or such a decision and you look at the number and you measure the cost of all the negative consequences if the positive are outweigh the negative that's a sign you should make the decision build that wing hire that person uh, relocate somewhere else and if the negatives outweigh the positives that's your sign don't do that Go look for something else where the positive will maximally outweigh the negative. Here's the problem. When corporations follow this advice, they are not required by law or by regulation to count, let alone to measure, but even to list or count all of the negative social consequences that flow from their decision to move. Bingo. There's no accountability. They don't have to answer to anyone. If they just want to pick up and move their company, they can. If they decide that it's more profitable for them to get their, their parts from overseas than to have as many people employed at their company making those parts, they can just say, okay, I'm laying off half of you guys 
and we're going to start getting our parts from China. We're going to start getting our parts from Canada or Mexico. They don't care because that actually makes them more money. They get more profit if they have less employees. It was greed that drove this. It was absolute greed. Imagine what a city like Detroit would be like today if Ford didn't sell out. Imagine if Ford decided to keep all the parts made here in the United States, not to look for cheap labor. Imagine what Detroit would look like today. And this goes to every one of those cities that have had factories that have had companies that decided to do the same thing to get cheap labor. Imagine what Cleveland would be like today. Imagine what Toledo would be like today. Imagine what Gary, Indiana would be like today. Detroit may be a place that you may desire to move to today if that did not happen. Something to think about. Rome, my comrade from RBN, Rome told me very first time I interviewed Rome, this was over a year ago, Rome told me he watched Detroit close 40 schools. And therefore, they come up with lovely, say, look, we're going to make this kind of money if we move to China. We pay half the wages or a quarter of the wages. We don't have to obey this, that, and the other law that we have here in the United States. Uh, it's wonderful. We're going to make more money. Therefore, we're going. And in our strange culture, this kind of logic, we're all nodding there, even though it has ripped off the United States on a scale that's horrible. If you actually counted all the negative consequences of factories and offices moving, you might very well come up with a negative much larger than the positive. But we'll mm. never know because we don't require it. And therefore companies leave when it's profitable and behind they leave a mess. And let me add one thing. The prime example that I use to teach this is the city of Detroit, which deserves a, a primacy because it has been so important in American history, the center mm. of our automobile industry. In the 1970s, presidents of the United States would take visitors from other countries, you know, prime ministers and everything, and take them to Detroit. And there they would showcase Detroit. Look at this. All these Ford, uh, General Motors, Chrysler factories. How many Did you hear what he just said? They used to bring prime ministers to Detroit and showcase Detroit. That's how great Detroit used to be. Don't see much of that now, right? No, you don't. Look at all these workers. Look at the wages they get. Look at the fact that there's a significant number of them that are African Americans giving those folks an opportunity they mostly did not have elsewhere at that time. Look at it, look at it, look at it. Population of Detroit, 1970, just shy, 2 million people. Now fast forward now. We're talking 50 years later. Detroit's fortunes are a downline a downline that never stops going down. The mm. population of Detroit now is around 700,000 people. In yeah, because people moved out because the jobs, that's the thing, when the jobs start to leave, the people who can afford to move will move and the people who can't will be stuck there. Detroit's fortunes are a downline a downline that never stops going down. The population of Detroit now is around 700,000 people. In other words, over 50 years, more, significantly more than half the people left the city of Detroit because there were no jobs, there were no, no stores open anymore, houses were being abandoned, they were falling down, they were catching fire, it was dangerous everywhere. The stories are, I mean, I could go on, I don't, everybody knows. But here's what I wanna stress. We as a nation watched 
for 50 years, that's half a century, that we watched this process, not just in Detroit, but in many, many other cities. Cleveland, I mean, literally the same story. My hometown, Youngstown, again, I could go on. And Watch, there's a documentary. I saw it on Netflix. I'm not sure if it's still on Netflix anymore, but if you Google it, you should be able to have an option where you can click like uh, streaming where it will show you where it's streaming. But there's a documentary called Believe Land and it's about Cleveland. It's, it's Some of it's about LeBron James, but they start off with the history of Cleveland. I highly recommend if you can watch that documentary to watch it because it talks about just what Professor Wolf is saying, saying here. How once upon a time, Cleveland was a booming city with the most Fortune 500 companies in the United States. And then again, like I said, CEOs got greedy and started to, we're gonna do cheap labor, we're gonna send these parts overseas. And one by one, these the factories and everything started to close. And that's when Cleveland started to go into decline. But if you can watch the documentary, it's called Believe Land, and it's about Cleveland. So definitely check that out if you can. And nothing was done that succeeded. Lots of hype, about this program and that pro every politician is gonna turn it around. It's like presidents, the last eight presidents we've had have promised to bring back manufacturing to America. Every one of them promised, none yep. of them ever delivered. You know, so, so that we, you can be sure that Mr. Uh, Biden, if he's the candidate and whoever the Republican will be promising to do it all again, standing before the cameras at a, a factory where some foreign entity is going to invest money, never following up to, to discover that the foreign entity found a better place to do it and kissed everybody goodbye, often after getting subsidies from the local uh, governmental authorities. It, it is a despicable criticism of capitalism. To allow that is, yep. is unspeakable and it means not to preempt where you're going with it, uh, RJ, but it means if you don't address that basic structural reality, you're not going to solve these ones. Capitalism is driven by profit. That's the holy uh, grail. That's the bottom line. That's what we're in business for. And if you let that continue, that system built around that logic, then they're going to come and they're going to go. And we're going to see a world in which every country is warring with every other countries to bring them, uh, the corporations, to their part of the woods rather than another. And nobody cares about the social consequences of the factories leaving. The decisions are made in elegant hotel suites where representatives of the government that wants you to come cuts a deal with the corporate board of directors and everybody goes out to a very expensive dinner right afterwards. That was spot on. And something that he mentioned there too that I thought was interesting, notice he mentioned every presidential candidate, they've been saying that they're gonna bring back manufacturing. It's not just Biden, it's been Clinton, it's been Obama, it's been, it doesn't matter if they're Republican or Democrat, they run on that and why is that? Because they know they still need the Rust Belt in order to win. So of course they're gonna tell you that. Now this is not to mean there aren't any gains being made in making that happen. But I do wanna say, I don't want people to get their hopes up because I don't want you to, to believe that it will ever be the way it was before because I don't think that it will. We have more technology now. There's also AI. So you have to understand that this is something I agree with Andrew Yang on in reference to AI. Listen, a lot of these jobs have been automated now. So the idea of bringing manufacturing back to the way it was during the industrial revolution, when you do have these assembly lines of people and workers just there to push the products along, those days, of manufacturing. It will never be that way because of automation. It will never be that way again. So I, I want you to understand that, that when they talk about bringing back manufacturing, that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean necessarily that they're going to, they're, they're not going to bring back, uh, how can I say this? 
I don't want you to think that it's going to be that type of manufacturing. And I think a lot of times when we hear manufacturing, that's what we think of the assembly line with the workers, right? I think those days are far in between. Those days are kind of long gone, to be honest with you. A lot of it is automated. So what that means is when these candidates tell you that they're going to bring back manufacturing, I want you to remember what I just told you nine times out of 10, a lot of these jobs are going to be automated. So what they may need is for people to be able to handle things on the technical end, which means you may still have to have some type of engineering degree to do the job. Whereas before you didn't have to, before, even if you didn't have a high school diploma, you could go work at a factory. You see the difference? So this is one thing, you know, there are things I disagree with Andrew Yang about, but when he talks about automation and AI, I agree with him on that because you talk to people who work in manufacturing right now, who are manufacturing engineers, they've seen the changes themselves. So that's just something to keep in mind. No, absolutely. And before we leave the topic of Detroit, Richard Wolf, I do want to mention that in 90, uh, late 60s, I would guess 68 or so, Smokey Robinson and the Miracles, Smokey Robinson recorded a song called I Care About Detroit that began with this little monologue. I looked it up while we were talking. He speaks, he says, there are many reasons why one cares about a city, why you care about its problems, its people, and indeed its very future. Is it friendly, warm, hospitable? Are there good opportunities, educational facilities, and a cultural center? Are you proud to call it your hometown? When you come to, right down to it, I'll bet you'll all agree to a resounding Hello. yes when you're talking about Detroit. Now, Smokey could record that song in the belief that the post-industrial, post-World War II growth we were seeing guaranteed a secure future for Detroit. For Detroit, he could indulge in some boosterism, what have you. Uh, maybe the Chamber of Commerce asked him to record it, I don't know. But, but whatever it was, those words just are bitter and ironic now because they suggest we were all, uh, you know, soul uh, R&B stars and regular working people alike uh, living in a shared delusion about what the future was going to be. And that never stops. I mean, I could sit down with you now and I could show you a hundred promotional videos, movies, theater pieces, uh, articles, editorials, op-eds telling us, for example, that the high-tech telecommunications uh, giants of Silicon Valley, they are the sort of future, and the United States is going to be as dominant, and just like it was said about cars. You know, mm. it, it, it's unbelievable. You can sell that, that dead horse uh, as if it's going to take you into tomorrow, and you can apparently do it over and over again, to the same people who seem not have understood when when a few industries tell you how wonderful everything is you should be reaching for your wallet to hold on to it because someone else is about to reach in there and take everything you have uh silicon valley can look as desolate you can travel to San Jose, California, which is the center of it, and you can see the future desolation when capitalism has found another place or another product. And I have to jump in here and I just want to add San Jose is unaffordable for the average person now. And it wasn't always that way. That's how Silicon Valley has spread. Like, oh, Silicon Valley, oh, it's a little too expensive right here. Uh, let's open up some businesses in San Jose because it's cheaper to live here. Now it's not cheaper to live there anymore. Because something that I want to mention, when Professor Wolf, he talks about the people who left Detroit after they started, you know, getting rid of the jobs, the, the people who could afford to move, where did they move to? Does anybody ever ask that question? Where did the people who could afford to leave Detroit when they started to get rid of the jobs, where did those people move to? I would like to say they moved to the coast. 
I would like to say they moved to places like California. They moved to Massachusetts. They moved to these coasts. And I think this is where we started to get gentrification. This is when you started to get people who moved to Boston, right? They might have been making a little bit more money in Detroit. Who knows? At that point in time, they have the money. They moved to a Boston. But they're like, oh, let's go live in a, a, a cheaper neighborhood here in Boston. But we'll offer to pay more. I believe this is actually when gentrification started. When they started to move the jobs out in the Rust Belt, and then you had people, the ones who could afford to move, moved out to the coast. Oh, Delthea, <laughs> I already told you where they moved. Many moved south or many moved south. What's that, JB? JB Fonts in the house, Miami, West Palm Beach. See? And these places started to increase. Miami's not cheap. Hmm? In which to make money. That's the way the system works. You know, the United States was the beneficiary. After we, be, particularly after we became independent in, in 1776, and we fought that second war with Britain to break from the empire in 1812, the rest of that century was, was an explosion of profitability here, which is why the 19th century and maybe even the first part of the 20th was a time of economic growth. That's when Detroit went from a tiny town that nobody cared about into the colossus of American capitalism. But it would be naive not to understand that like the ball that goes up, it comes down. Capitalism is exactly that way. Profit went elsewhere. One of the places it went was to the People's Republic of China, which is now producing more cars than we are. Even there General Motors produces more cars in China than it produces here. They've kissed the United States. United States goodbye. They have abandoned the United States. And the only really interesting question is, why do the American people permit themselves to be abused in this way? And there is no solution for the Rust Belt unless that fact is confronted. There's your answer right there, guys. Why do the American people allow themselves to be abused this way? There's no solution for the Rust Belt unless this can be confronted. And I believe he's 100% right there. That's the only way things are actually going to change. So the name of this video is called Professor Richard Wolf, Can the Rust Belt Be Saved? Please check it out. It's a much longer video. Um, and this is the Zero Hour with RJ Eskow. So please check out that video if you have a chance so you can watch the full thing. These are things that, you know, I think we need to pay more attention to because oftentimes I feel like the Rust Belt is forgotten about until people need votes. I'm gonna go to some of the chats here. Delthea says, when my family left Georgia back during the great migration, they went to Detroit. Their descendants have been moving south for decades now. I can see that Delthea. Thank you for the super chat, Jorge Hernandez. And the most that a person gets paid in Mexico is $2 an hour. That is on General Motors. Ouch. Patty says middle class jobs were lost with NAFTA. Elites knew exactly what they were doing in the name of capitalism, AKA making more profit. I hear you, I hear you. LD says, I worked at a radiator factory, UAW. They moved in 2007, Buffalo, New York to New Mexico. Bad Cookie says, which means they can lower wages for STEM fields since the market would be saturated by trained workers. That's right. That's right. This is why when, uh, when I was still in higher ed and they used to say, we need to promote STEM. We need to bring you know, more high school students over to STEM for college. I used to say, well, if everybody does STEM, it's gonna be oversaturated. I saw this happen with law, right? I remember everybody was trying to go to law school. You don't want it to become oversaturated. So 
We have to find a way for people to be able to use the talents that they have and not just the answer shouldn't be for everybody to just go into STEM. 